Interstellar Marines, a game about space sharks, immersive co-op, intense PvP, helmet mechanics, and really, really scary robots. This is a game that's been in process for 18 years. I'm Wicked Wiz, being a man of my word and standing on my desk. This is what went wrong with Interstellar Marines. We'll take a look at this game as it currently stands and dig deeper to see what actually went wrong. And a massive thanks to my beloved Patreons. You guys helped to keep Raid Shadow VPN at bay. So what in the salty pits of this Nevada training facility is Interstellar Marines? Well, let's have a look at what Steam has to say. Interstellar Marines is an immersive tactical sci-fi first-person simulator in the making, offering a unique blend of tactical gameplay, dynamic environments, and non-scripted AI. Play single-player or co-op and PvP on servers around the world. Interstellar Marines is inspired by movies such as Aliens, Starship Troopers, and Saving Private Ryan, and games such as Half-Life, Deus Ex, System Shock 2, and Rainbow Six 3, Raven Shield. Interstellar Marines is all about evolving the FPS recipe with the inspirations we've assimilated since the birth of this genre. Our goal is an evolutionary leap forward, driven by our compulsive interest in science fiction, role-playing, military realism, and respect for first-person immersion. There's some pretty cool mechanics in this game, especially for its time. Considering this game was released all the way back in 2013, before a lot of survival games that we have today. As an interstellar marine, you have some standard issue guns, such as an automatic rifle for long range, an SMG for closer encounters, and a pistol that doesn't really look like a pistol, that to be honest, you're only really gonna use in stressful situations. As far as I can see, there aren't any loadouts for this game, but each weapon that you do have has its own attachments, such as a suppressor, laser sight, and a flashlight. The suppressor is your best choice, especially when playing alone. However, the process of putting it on kind of breaks the immersion. I mean, what is that? The helmet is arguably the most interesting mechanic. With your helmet closed, you get a full HUD that displays your ammo, attachments, fire options, TP or training points, a compass and the ability to see waypoints, and finally your SO2, which allows you to see how much you're exerting your body. The higher the percentage, the more exhausted you are, the blurrier your vision gets, and the heavier you breathe. This also impacts your aim, so running away is probably best left as your last resort. When your helmet is up, you get none of this, but you do gain the added benefit of better hearing. This worked better for PvP as far as I can remember, but in single player, it's not all too necessary. You're better off with your helmet down and a HUD display. In regards to PvP, your helmet will show who's on your team and who's not, but with sneakier players, you also need to hear better with the helmet open. This game supports friendly fire, so you really need to pick your moments because in a stressful situation, it's very easy to mistake a teammate for an enemy. Recently, I played through two of the available missions of this game to understand a little bit more about the general experience and level design. The multiplayer servers are currently dead, so this is my only option. Sound is the most important aspect to this immersion. From the moment I got out of the spacecraft and shot this guy in the dick, I could feel the room just by sound alone. Attention to all crew. Some of our benefactors from Eurogen Pharma Corporation are visiting this facility on the 27th. In this mission specifically, the Neurogen incident, the power was off and I needed to turn it back on. But to do this, I must confront my one and only enemy, the mannequins, or at least that's what I like to call them. The AI on these guys is unpredictable and unnerving, as I can hear these things running around, but I can't yet see them. That is, until I look over to a container. Now I've had my first encounter and I know what I'm up against and how fast these things move. As long as I can hear footsteps, I know I'm in danger, which means every move needs to be calculated. In this mission on normal mode, I only have five respawns, so make too many mistakes and I have to start from the beginning. However, these enemies are unfortunately the only AI in the game. In some early trailers, they promised big robots and the beloved yet forgotten 
land sharks. They actually tease these land sharks quite a lot and a lot of people were really looking forward to them. I remember seeing these things and buying the game just for that. I mean, co-op against mutated beasts is something out of an SCP nightmare and I love it, but unfortunately these guys are yet to be seen. I'll be honest though, these mannequins still put me on edge and hearing them run about is honestly terrifying. Towards the end of this mission, I had to access a mainframe within a research facility to gain information on what the hell was going on. Once I did this, the whole station went into a self-destruct mode and bloody hell, it was loud. What this did is it took away my most valuable asset, the ability to hear what's around the corner. It doesn't matter if my helmet's up so I can hear better. In fact, no, it's even worse. Now I was blinded yet still able to see, which resulted in me getting jumped twice before eventually completing the mission. I love this part about the game. It feels like a horror in some cases, but even more so, it feels like I'm actually there and because I can simply open my helmet and no longer see my HUD, it takes you away from feeling like this is just another FPS and makes it feel more like a military simulator. I know that this is one of the goals that they had for the game and I feel like they were most definitely getting somewhere with this. So what in the ever-loving shit happened? I've shown you some of the best bits about this game and it's clear that this game really did have some potential, but with the only update on Steam all the way back in 2019, the game is still left with limited content, a lot of negative reviews, and a community that seems to be asking if this game will ever be finished. Our story begins with the creative director Kim, the original founder of this game. The man with the plan who got together with his friends to form Zero Point Software, an indie game development company forged in the pits of Copenhagen. The year is 2004 and this is where things start. Kim proposed the idea of this game to one of his friends who had a lot of money and with a small team of three, they got together to conceptualize this game. Their plan was to create some sort of trilogy, with Interstellar Marine's prologue being the first in this series. Prologue is what I believe the developers are still working on now and have been for the past 18 years. In 2006, with a small team of now four, they managed to conceptualize and produce a trailer that they would end up showing to publishers and investors. This was a good little trailer. I mean, it's very dated, but it showed a great deal of innovation. They shared this at GDC and as a result gained interest from publishers which secured an Unreal Evaluation license as well as enough funding for a team of 20 people. It's now 2008 and all is good. Well, what else happened in 2008? The global financial crisis, of course. And it was said to be the most serious financial crisis since the Great Depression. This really was not the best time to be producing any games, especially as a small indie developer. Not long after this crisis, all publishers for Interstellar Marines had pulled out, leaving the developers with empty pockets, forcing them to lay off their staff, drop their Unreal license, and file for bankruptcy. The game died before it could even walk. But when you have an idea, something that resonates with people, you can be sure that those in support of your dreams will come to your aid. So with a supportive community and a willingness to achieve their goals, in 2009 Zero Point Software decided to recover whatever they had left from their previous concepts and moved over to Unity in a mission to restart development. On the 10th of May 2009 they posted a video to assure that the game is still in development and that this setback won't stop them. For the love of the game, it's really here being in it for the game and not the money. It really dictates the way you make decisions. That we're all committed to this because we want to make the greatest games absolutely possible. It's gotta be created. I have to play it. It was clear from this that they simply just wanted to make a good game for people to enjoy. In this video, they expressed their dream of just having a supportive community and later down the line, eventually reducing the cost of the game so more people can play it. Now, for the next three years, they relied purely on their supportive community by providing demos and selling pre-orders for the game. But during this time, they were still searching for ways to fund this game. And in 2012, they finally set up a Kickstarter campaign in the hopes to secure nearly 600 thousand dollars. The video for Kickstarter was creative and shared the vision of the game. Throughout this we see Kim talking to himself, suggesting that he's gone absolutely batshit insane, but they're making it very clear that they're trying to make a game that's just not another ripoff of Call of Duty, saying that this was going to be more of an immersive experience with role-playing mechanics for your marine, meaningful co-op and intense PvP. In all fairness, this Kickstarter did see a lot of success. However, things didn't go to plan as they didn't meet their goal. Perhaps it was too 
too ambitious. Maybe this wasn't the game that that many people were really looking forward to, or that the funding goal for this game was way too high. Either way, they were yet again left with no additional funding. There were people in this community who recommended that they should try again, perhaps with a different approach. I found out later that they did think about this, but it's clear that there were no other attempts made on Kickstarter, which is a shame because this could have been a success on the second time round. However, the team held strong and they were still committed to making this game. So this wasn't the end. They technically didn't need all this money to achieve their goals. All this did was slow them down in development. But as we'll find out later, this funding really could have gone a long way. In this time, Steam Greenlight became a massive opportunity for a lot of indie game devs. Greenlight allowed developers to publish an early access version of their game, which helped to secure funding as well as community feedback for many games. I remember this being a significant step forward within gaming, because there were so many great ideas out there that honestly couldn't have existed without this feature. There were also a bunch of scams and terribly deceptive developers that came along with Greenlight, but we can take a look at some of those in later videos. So feel free to subscribe and hit the bell notification if you don't want to miss out on that. Anyway, with Greenlight, Zero Point Software saw an opportunity, and in the same year, 2012, Interstellar Marines was successfully greenlit. It only took them till 2013 to finally release an early access version of the game. So now they have exposure to the largest PC gaming platform out there, and as a result of this, they received much more support, successfully selling many copies of the game and of of course, gaining some exposure on YouTube. Between 2013 and 2014, they released a bunch of updates to improve their multiplayer game modes, as well as adding new content to the base game. With every update, the team got closer and closer to a more immersive experience that people would be satisfied with. It wasn't till later in September of 2014, where they successfully fulfilled their promise of a co-op campaign with their first mission named The Neurogen Incident. We've already had a look at this game mode, and it pits you against a bunch of hostile, defective robots in an abandoned research facility. The mission is to figure out what happened and escape, leaving no man behind. I do actually remember playing this with a friend a long time ago, and although I was rubber banding all over the place with my terrible connection and terrible laptop, it was still a fun experience and gave me a lot of hope for the game. Only a few months later, they released another mission called Assault on Star Crown Aerospace, where you're tasked to infiltrate a facility in order to test its defenses. At this point, it's clear that these guys are delivering on their promise and the community only grew as a result of it. Still no land sharks or aliens, but still a good time. In 2015, the development on Interstellar Marines continued with tweaks and bug fixes. And after the feedback from the new co-op missions, they had a much greater sense of confidence in their concept for an immersive experience. Now Zero Point wanted to experiment with multiplayer, so they got together to conceptualize a game mode called Hell Week. This would be a 63 player game mode where you would have to battle in nine different zones and environments all of which simulated in the training facility. They eventually released this in mid-2015 and turned out to be quite a big hit within the community, only increasing their support along with a larger player base. And with this came advancements to their already existing mechanics, which would only help to improve their co-op experience even further. So all seems pretty good, right? They're making progress with the game and the community seems somewhat happy, but this is where things get depressing. The interest in the game started to dwindle and Zero Point state that their 2015 winter sale on Steam really didn't go to plan. This year we've had a really bad winter sale. We only made about 10% of what we did in revenue last year and this Monday we had to sit down with the team and we had to let three of our employees go. Paul, our coding producer, phenomenal guy, really, really talented. Our two programmers, Nico and Miki, I mean, extremely talented senior programmers. Um, it breaks my heart losing these three guys. Um, As a result, in lacking sales, they had to let some people go. Now the team is much smaller and development is slower. They had this hope that they could continue funding the game via Steam purchases. But like anything, the interest in this game comes in spikes, and relying on Steam purchases alone is not the most reliable source of funding, especially with such an ambitious project as this. The team is now much smaller, but these guys won't give up. They promised something, and they wanted to deliver this game, not just for the benefit of their dreams, but for the dreams 
aims of the community. In 2016, Zero Point yet again looked for publishers and investors who might be interested in their project, sending off demo packages left, right and center while still trying to keep their intellectual property. Alongside this, they set up a volunteer development team full of committed individuals who simply just wanted to see this game succeed. But this wasn't enough. Without investment, they simply could not get back to the same pace as before, which led to slower updates and a community that would later move on to much bigger games. This game was undoubtedly on life support at this point and people were starting to wonder if this game had already died. From 2016 to 2019, Zero Point released updates with practically no funding, still looking for someone to invest. In a video about their struggles, Kim gives a pep talk in a scrum meeting, assuring that the game is still in progress with a team of volunteers behind it. Although in this, he does stress how difficult it has been to manage the flow of volunteers coming in and leaving the project. So there have been many moments where Kim has been on his own and has received help, which of course is pretty difficult when you're trying to build a game. There isn't that sense of stronger coordination that you would have with full-time staff, because of course, these volunteers are just doing this in their free time. Today, in 2022, not much else has changed. As we already know, in 2020, the world went through another global disaster. Now they have this game, which is a hollow, outdated ghost town of what could have been, but never was. Strangely enough, though, there is evidence to suggest that the development of this game is still ongoing. I had a look at their public trailer board to see if there were any updates, and the only thing I could really find were comments from 2021, which, of course, isn't too long ago, and and could suggest that they're still working on this game. And in all honesty, I believe that Kim is still trying to make this game a reality. And to support that claim, here's a comment from one of their developers. Development has been very slow at late due to the C virus, along with other world events going on at the moment. And we are currently in process of dealing with something important regarding Interstellar Marines that cannot be disclosed at this moment. The search for a publisher slash investor is still ongoing, but has paused at this time due to previously mentioned real world events and a matter of importance that can't be disclosed. We also believe that we may need to implement some additional goals for our game before considering repitching to publishers slash investors. The better Interstellar Marines is, the better our chances are. So in short, yes, we're still here and still going. I can't say for certain if they've completely dropped the project, but evidence suggests that we will probably hear from these guys at some point in the future. So what actually happened? Well, if it wasn't obvious, it was funding. A lot of funding issues with this game. From the global financial crisis, to a failed Kickstarter, which led to slower updates and a community that just lost interest. It's crazy to think that this game has almost been in two decades worth of development. And I've really got to hand it to these guys that they have stayed committed to this project throughout all of that. There have been ups and downs and moments of demoralization. Building a game this ambitious is not easy, especially without a big team of developers to get you through it. I personally think this game could have been something. It's just unfortunate that they didn't get the funding that they needed. The situation that they're in now is that this game is quite outdated and there are many really good realistic simulation games out there that they now have to compete with. So I don't know if they're going to gain as much interest when or if they ever release this game. But in all honesty, I do wish them the best. A lot of people, including myself, felt cheated because of the promises that were made but never came a reality. But taking a deeper look into this whole project and what they've been through gave me a better perspective as to why. And I'd like to say again a massive thanks to my patrons. It honestly means the world to me to see that people would go that far to support this channel. If you're interested, you can support this channel for as little as one pound or subscribe for free. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one where I stand on my chair.